Welcome to the History Maven. Thanks for joining me on today's episode. Grab your scuba gear because today we're taking the deepest dive ever as we talk about Alcatraz. From Robin Hood to Ocean's Eleven, there's something about thieves we can't get enough of. While we don't want to personally fall victim, we are titillated by tales of the reversal of fortune utilizing less than ethical means. And maybe that's why when three petty criminals made an attempt to escape a prison island in 1962, the world was rooting for them. Today we'll be talking about the great American mystery known as the escape from Alcatraz and the theories about what befell the escapees. Now, folks, I can't keep talking in this Miss Mojo voice forever. Today, we're going to be history maven, raw and unedited. I'm going to have to come off the cuff and a little raw. We're going to have to power through my mush mouth today because this video is so packed for the weeks and weeks of research I've done. I've got the juiciest theories, some unheard information. So stick with me. If I mispronounce things, if I skip a little, get a little out of order, You'll forgive me because today's information is so worth it. But let's go ahead and get into this story that has me so wackadoodle obsessed. Let's set the scene first. In the middle of San Francisco Bay in Northern California sits an island of 22 acres. From the shore of this rocky island, San Francisco looks very close. You can see the skyline. You can practically wave to people. But that distance of water between Alcatraz and San Francisco is very deceiving. The water is turbulent and icy cold and extremely dangerous. This was a prime spot for the U.S. government to establish a military prison. But in the 1930s, crime was high nationwide. Prisons were packed. It was the Great Depression. People were making money by any means necessary. And escapes from these prisons were far too common. So Alcatraz was turned over to the U.S. Justice Department for housing the nation's particularly disruptive inmates. The prison saw the likes of Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly, the bootlegging gangster, not the platinum blonde rapper. And this is how we come to the subjects of our story. The Anglin brothers John and Clarence and Frank Morris were all put in Alcatraz for frequent escape attempts at other federal prisons. We're going to go into a little bit of background about the guys before we get to our theories. Let's start with Frank. Now, Frank Lee Morris was and is an enigma. Even with his best friends, he kept his personal information vague. He was stoic. So you can imagine how close he played his cards when he was talking to prison officials. He gave his birth dates ranging from 1922 to 1928 in at least six known aliases. He claimed he had no living relatives. But I've been hired at work. I've told you weeks of work, and I have uncovered the tragic details of his family background. I'm still researching a couple of details, and I'll unveil that in another video, perhaps. But what I can tell you today is Frank Lee Morris was born in 1926, and he has living relatives to this day. Now, I can understand why Frank didn't want to ruminate over his past. He had a very sad and lonely upbringing. He was taken from his teen mom, who had her own tragic story, and put in foster care at the age of one. And when social workers came to remove the infant from her home, his mother confessed that the man that she had just married before Frank's birth, Edward F. Morris, was not his father. His biological father was Frank T. Tonker. We will get into their background later. Now, Frank made the rounds of these foster homes, and according to his last foster mother, his biological mother used to visit him a lot when he was small, but her visits would upset him. He would cry a lot when she'd leave, so she visited a lot less frequently as time went on. Now, he was to never know his father or stepfather. He ended up in foster care with no one to claim him, especially in past decades. Foster care was rough. It was known for allowing abuse and neglect of children, and Frank dealt with this the best way he could, which was from by repeatedly running away from these homes. So he was arrested for the first time at the age of 11. He was already in the juvenile court system by 13, and he was sent at 14 to the National Training School for Boys, where they tested Frank's IQ, and it was extremely high, 133. The average in the U.S. is 98. So Frank was a smart boy. Now, while at the National Training School for Boys, he escaped, of course, and was again recaptured. 
but back to a time when Frank was still living with his foster mother, probably Mrs. G. Carasotas. Um, she told the national the National Star paper that his biological parents were dead. Now Frank had no family to call his own. He didn't think anyone cared about him. He had no one to really answer to. So to his way of thinking he had no reason to stay out of trouble. He fell into a cycle of stealing and being arrested and escaping. He did this across the United States, multiple states full of petty crimes. Now, finally, he broke out of an Ohio prison where he was being held for burglary and narcotics. The federal government sent him a one-way ticket to Alcatraz. He had heard this was called the inescapable prison and he was so up for that challenge. As soon as Frank arrived, he told fellow inmates at Alcatraz that he was gonna break out. He had no trouble finding accomplices to aid him in the getaway. In fact, two of his inmates, the other inmates were John and Clarence Anglin. They actually had known one another in a previous jail. And they were also known as having a penchant for liberating themselves from prisons. Now, unlike Frank, who came from a really lonely, rough family with no one to care for him, John and Clarence Anglin had a very tight, loving family, a huge family. But they were a poor migrant family, and they moved from state to state picking things like cherries, and they just did not make enough money to support all the kids because they had 11 other siblings at home. There was not enough food to go around. So the boys contributed by doing what they could. They started stealing in their early 20s to help the family get by. And then they would rob banks when the banks were closed at night. But their last robbery attempt at a bank was a stick-up act. They used a fake gun though. Now, actually Clarence and John, everyone who knew them, said they were actually very nice guys. Even in the hostage situation at the bank, they were giving people water and asking them if they were okay and checking on them. They used to babysit all the neighborhood kids, and they were just generally kind to everyone and very well-liked gentlemen. Now, they had been in jails across the country plenty of times before, and they had no problem busting their way out which is how they found themselves as cellmates in Alcatraz. They were biding their time. They were given 35 year life sen well, sentences, life pretty much at their age, and they had no intention of serving out that whole time. So with the assistance of other inmates who provided materials and information and lookouts, Frank Morris, the Anglin brothers, and another prisoner, Alan West, all began plotting their escape from the island. You see, Frank had noticed a few things upon arriving. The walls of the cells were plaster and concrete. They were very soft from the moist lake air. And he also noted that the guards didn't really pay them any attention because they were model prisoners and there were some bad dudes that the guards had to deal with there. The previous escape attempts from the island were very well known to the inmates. All of those who had attempted to escape either died or were recaptured. One escapee swam across all the way, but he then contracted hypothermia and had to call for help and be hospitalized and was returned to his cell. So Frank, John, and Clarence, and Alan, they were all good swimmers, but Frank devised a plan where he didn't think swimming would even be necessary. He didn't want to get in that cold water. They built a raft out of 50 raincoats that were either stolen or donated by prisoners, as well as life jackets, and they crafted paddles out of old boards. Some of the ideas and devices they used in their plan were actually taken from Popular Mechanics magazine. They found lots of copies in Frank's room. Now, all of the guys actually had some kind of background in mechanics or engineering. I think it even said that Frank on his prison card said that he made blueprints. Why would you put all these guys near each other, all these known escapees? Mm. And so they used the motor of a vacuum cleaner to make a drill and they used that to cut through some of the vents. Frank would cover up a lot of the drilling noises by playing his accordion while the others tunneled through the walls. And then they fashioned these dummy heads out of painted plaster and sheets and soap. These are actually pretty good for someone just making this at night when no one's looking out of found materials. And they topped them with hair that they got off the prison barbershop floor. Now, they chose the date of June 11th. Now, it was a bit warmer and the water was a little more calm that time of year, but I think they also chose the date of escape because the warden was away on a fishing trip. 
The plan was to rip out the vents in their rooms that they had lightly sealed and place dummy heads in the bed and exit via the tunnels. But poor old Alan West couldn't get out in time. Frank, John, and Clarence made it out of the prison without capture. The guards did hear a large, like, rumble, really loud bang from the roof. But then they listened and no other sounds followed, so they thought it was fine. All the prisoners seemed to be in their beds. Alan did try to get out in time, but his vent was stuck. It had hardened too much in the cement around it. So when he finally did get out and he saw that everyone had left and fled without him, he just went back to his cell and went on to sleep. In the morning, the heads were discovered, and the whole story was out. Alan confessed everything, but it was too late because the men were long gone. Their raft and personal items that were in a plastic bag were found on the shore of the closest piece of land, which was Angel Island. But it's time to get into our theory, so let's find out what happened to Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers. Let's dig into the theory, starting with death theories and claims. Now, theory number one is that they drowned, obviously. In 1979, the FBI closed the case and marked the fate of the escapees as presumed dead. According to Alan West, they had planned on stealing clothes and a car when they got into Marin County, but no thefts were reported. Now, National Geographic dug up some of the old newspaper articles that said a blue car had been stolen from that area and that dozens of citizens said they saw the men in a car. So let's talk about the Norwegian freighter, too, um, that supports the death theory. A Norwegian freighter spotted a body in the water about a month after the escape, and it seemed to be wearing blue denim pants that were similar to the Alcatraz uniform pants. But this was close to the Golden Gate Bridge, too, which is a notorious spot for the suicidally depressed to end their lives. About 1,400 people over the last 75 years have uh, committed suicide there. So a lot of people speculate that this body was a result of self-harm and not of the raft crashing. The raft the men had fashioned looked like it had been ripped apart, though, by the water, and this made the FBI think they were dead. They turned the case over to the U.S. Marshals, who are now responsible for the case. This case remains open until the men were 100 years old each. Now, another fact to consider in favor of the death theory is that Frank had several hard to disguise tattoos, numbers and a star on his knee, a devil on his arm, the letter C, the letters NTSB, a circle on his hand, a star on his forehead which seems to have perhaps been removed. Some people say he cut it out, it looked like he did in a picture, so he may not have that still, but if he had that especially, he'd be pretty easy to spot. But even with all these, it seems like he'd be identifiable. Now, theory two is that they escaped, but were murdered. A dying man dictated a deathbed confession to his nurse in 2016, claiming that he and another man picked up the fugitives in a white boat from Alcatraz, and that they murdered and buried the escapees for $40,000 that the men had been given by their families. Now, $40,000 in today's money would be $400,000. But see, Frank didn't seem to have much of a family, and the Anglins were far from wealthy. So knowing that casts a lot of doubt on this theory, plus you can't trust a deathbed confession. Do you know how many people have claimed to be D.B. Cooper on their deathbeds? Look it up. Now theory three is that they all made it to shore and two walked away. Police found the life believed to have been crafted in prison. The papers claim that it was Fred Wilkinson, the deputy director of U.S. Prisons, theorized that the Anglins may have killed Frank to keep him from squealing. But the FBI files don't actually mention that there was any blood or hair on the life jacket. Before we move on to theories favoring survival, I want to add a last thought for the claims that the three perished shortly after leaving the island. Though Frank, John, and Clarence had all escaped jails before, they were always reincarcerated. They had a hard time staying out of criminal activities, especially Frank. It's hard to believe that the guys stayed below the radar this long with their illegal means of making money or that they actually went legit altogether. Could you see Frank being legit? (laughs) Let's go on to survival theories and claims. Theory 4. The trio survived and the Anglins went to Brazil. The Anglin families gave a film crew who were making a documentary on the escape a photograph the family friend named Fred Britsey had given them. The photo was said to be John and Fred Anglin who were living in Brazil in 1975. 
Fred told the Anglin family that the men had escaped Alcatraz actually by using um, an electrical cord to tie their raft onto a boat that was leaving so they never had to paddle. An electrical cord actually was one of the missing items from the prison. A forensic team from Scotland who were forensic technicians used some facial software to determine that they did believe that this was an aged version of the Anglin brothers. However, Britsy, who was a known gangster and drug smuggler, his wife said her husband lied all the time. And when he came back from Brazil, he never mentioned that he saw the Anglins. He didn't mention this till much, much later. So she didn't believe him. Theory five, when the Anglins' brother Robert was dying, he admitted to the family that he had been in communication with the Anglins until about 1987 and that they were indeed in Brazil. The remaining family members wanted to go down to South America and try to find them, but they were told that that would be interfering in an open case and they could face legal consequences. So, more from the Anglin family to corroborate their version of events. One of the Anglin nephews said his grandmother told him in secret that his uncles had survived and that they visited her to say goodbye once. And then flowers with no cards were delivered on special occasions for years. And during the Anglin's mother's funeral, two large strange looking women who appeared to be men in dresses were attending and the FBI moved to question the women after the service but they'd already disappeared before the funeral ended. Let's move on to theory number six. They all survived and lived into the U.S. into old age. In 2018 a letter arrived to the San Francisco Police Department and the author claimed that he was a then 83 year old John Anglin who had cancer. He wrote that Frank had died in 2008 in Alexandria and his brother died in 2011. The letter stated that he resided in Seattle and Fargo and San Francisco and this letter asked for medical treatment and a guarantee of no more than one year in jail if he gave them his whereabouts. Some believe this was just a hoax because the letter also said that this had to be read on the evening news. The Anglins aren't sure this was John because they said that they thought he would come to the family for help. Comparison to John's known handwriting didn't yield any results. Either way, it was inconclusive. So theory seven is that they survived with outside help. A 1962 issue of the Evening Star News reported the men had help from the outside, allowing them to escape prison. A man claiming to be Frank's cousin, Bud Morris, said he was delivering bribe money to the Alcatraz guards before the escape. And this would explain why the guards didn't notice all these strange ongoings, the 50 missing raincoats, and they didn't investigate that deafening bang on the roof the night of the escape. Another outside help piece of evidence comes from Marin County housewife who told police she was watching the men on the raft with her binoculars reach one of the islands and that a speedboat visited the island about an hour later. But this event actually occurred 25 hours after the men were found to be missing. So they're not sure that this was accurate. 30, let's see, theory 8. But Morris is Frank Morris. Bud Morris of Rome, Georgia says he saw his cousin after the escape and that Frank visited his aunt in Detroit several times and visited him at a San Diego park once when he was with his daughter, as well as Bud said he received calls from Frank. Bud claims he cut off contact with Frank because he didn't want to get caught up in a federal investigation. His daughter says she actually remembers meeting her dad's friend Frank at the park that day, but she didn't know who he was. Now, Bud said he felt free to share his story with a 2012 team of newscasters um, because at the time of the interview, he was 89 and he didn't think anyone would put him in jail. Some people say that resemblance to him is a bit too uncanny. Plus, Frank told everyone that he didn't have any family and the records from the boys' home said he didn't have any family. So let's say it's unlikely that Frank is parading around on TV. <laughs> For one, his daughter would have actually been born prior to the 1962 escape, which would be pretty hard for Frank to sire a child while he was incarcerated. Now, I actually found Frank's, uh, James T., Frank's cousin, James T. Bud Morris's picture when he was young, and you can see this is not Frank. They don't look alike. 
I did find a James T. Bud Morris in Floyd County, Georgia via Thomas L. Morris's Bud's father. But I'm trying to figure out how Frank is even related to Bud if he is at all. Now, Bud did live in San Diego at the time that he claimed he visited Frank, which lines up to that story. But this means that Bud would have passed away in 2014 at the age of 92. So who would have been Frank's father? I went through all of Bud's family tree, and I can't find how he and Frank were related to Eddie Morris, I assume. Now, Frank's parents are listed as being Franklin Thomas Tonker and Thelma Mae Phillips. His mother married Eddie F. Morris prior to Frank's birth. His next of kin was actually listed as being Edna Ellison, but Frank always maintained he had no family. Frank's mysterious origin shall be a video unto itself in the future. <laughs> but more and more questions unveil themselves when it comes to this case. But let's get back on track to our theories and claims. Let's go to theory number nine. They survived and went to Mexico. Thomas Kent, a former inmate, was paid $2,000 for an interview. And in this interview, Kent relayed that Clarence Anglin arranged for his girlfriend to pick the men up for the prison and take them to Mexico. The inmates were even studying Spanish while in Alcatraz in preparation for their new lives. Now, it's only about 500 miles to the Mexican border, so that would have been a smart move. Though they might have been stopped by border police who were surely hunting for them. But more saying he met Frank in San Diego ties into the theory because San Diego is only 17 miles to the Mexico border. Let's talk theory 10. They all made it. They survived. And Frank moved to Ireland. The theory goes that Frank bummed around the U.S. for some years, but he had to be too careful, so he had an aunt at Cork, Ireland that set him up with a fake name and documents. Some say he lives there to this day. Some say he's buried under another name. This theory might have popped up because some Alcatraz documents were found in an antique store in Ireland, but they seem to be from a retired guard, Fred Freeman, and not a fugitive. <laughs> Alright, so let's do a little bit more evidence in favor of at least one of the Alcatraz trio surviving. An operator for the U.S. Marshal's office received a call shortly after the escape. The call said, I'm John Anglin and I want you to contact the U.S. Marshal's office. And the operator said, well, I'm not going to do that unless I know why. And the man on the other side of the phone said, do you know who I am? And the operator said, no. And the man said, read the newspapers. And he hung up. Now, could this have been a hoax? Hoax, absolutely, because hoaxes follow a lot of crimes that have high media coverage. But another piece of evidence comes from a postcard. A postcard from Seattle was sent to the warden that read, Ha ha, we made it. And it was signed from the three fugitives. Handwriting analysis was deemed inconclusive, but it was noted that it looked very similar to John's handwriting. Look at the signature. Some speculate that it was written before the guys made their breakout attempt and they arranged for it to be delivered so everyone would think that they stuck it to the man even if they didn't get out alive. Now an inmate by the name of Clarence Carnes said the men told him that they were going to send him a gone fishing postcard to verify that they made it out successfully. And he did indeed get that gone fishing postcard. Another piece of evidence is that it was reported that the raft paddle they found on Angel Island was leaned up against a rock as if someone walked up and left it there that way. Another inmate by the name of Bumpy Johnson said that he had a part in the escape because he arranged for the guys to be picked up by a boat from the outside and taken to Hunter's Point. Many people have successfully made that swim from prison at Alcatraz to Island, uh, Angel Island now. In fact, it's part of a yearly triathlon. The warden of Alcatraz argued that the men just weren't in good enough condition to that cold water because they hadn't been exercising, they hadn't been exposed to cold water. They just been saying they're prison cells, so it would have been very difficult for them to swim and survive that temperature of water. Now, the life jacket that the FBI found actually impressed them in their construction, and they said it would have been a great asset and possibly helped them survive crossing the bay. Now, I could research and read about Frank and the Anglins for the rest of my life, forever and ever, but this iceberg, it runs deep. 
I had to cut myself off or this video would never end. I mean hours, weeks and weeks of my life. Now, for example, when I was assembling this video, I came upon another theory that Franklin Morris was the Zodiac Killer. And um, I also came upon one that the men lived in Mariana, Florida. Now, there are probably a lot of ideas I didn't even get to explore here. So I'm going to need your help or I'll be doing this the rest of my life. So if I left out any theories or important facts, please leave that info in the comments for me. Now I'm thinking I really want to do an investigative video on Franklin Morris's heritage at some point because I did uncover so much and it's fascinating. I've been digging through the archives for weeks. So if you want to see that, please click subscribe, click the notification bell so you can stay in the loop for that video because it's coming. So what I want to know now is what do you guys think happened to the Alcatraz escapees? Did they survive that raft trip? You guys think they made it? Let me know. I want to hear your viewpoints. And as always, thanks so much for sticking around to the end. I appreciate you guys deeply. Have a wonderful day. See you in the next video.